All right, uh, I guess we'll, we'll get started. Uh, I'm Scott Kennedy. I didn't see, see your smiling faces a couple weeks ago. Unfortunately, I was out of town. Um, but just as a quick reminder for the PATH 520, make sure you sign in as well as complete the, the, um, the evaluations. Uh, it's really, really important for the faculty to have those evaluations, especially from students. So with that, I'm gonna let Christine Destesh take over. Right. Thank you. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joel Burlecht for the lecture um, this afternoon. So Joel got his PhD at University of Birmingham in Alabama. And then he did a postdoctoral fellowship in my lab here at University of Washington. And now he, as he rose to the rank, he's now an assistant professor. In, in the department. And um, Joel's main interest, I would say, has always been epigenetics. So when he did his uh, PhD as well, he was already interested in changes um, that are on the epigenome rather than, than the genome. He then um, developed an interest in my lab in the regulation of the X chromosome, and in particularly, uh, genes that escape X chromosome uh, inactivation. So um, he wrote very uh, well cited review actually about escape gene that escape inactivation and trying to understand what they do. So one of the things they do is that they create sex differences because they're more highly expressed in females. And so Joel also became very interested in sex differences and now he basically focused on his research, I would say, on sex differences and what are the genetic cause or epigenetic cause of sex differences. So, Joel. Okay, all right, thank you um, for attending. And I would like to thank Scott and Alex for the uh, invitation to talk. And of course, Christine for the um, nice introduction. And so um, today I'm gonna to talk about the genome-wide effects of sex chromosome dosage in sex differences in development and disease. Um, but first, okay. um, but first I wanna mention that, you know, sex differences in sex and gender medicine have become controversial topics. And I think a lot of controversy around this can be tracked back to a few important distinctions. Um, and understanding these distinctions is critical because they define any points of reference for any kind of conversation about sex differences. Um, so first, there's a difference between biological sex and the societal construct of gender. Um, and today I'll be talking about um, biological sex um, and uh, generally referring to males as individuals with um, XY chromosomes um, and testes and females um, with uh, individuals with ovaries and two X chromosomes. But this, this definition is, uh, this binary definition of biological sex is an overall simplification of what can be a much more complex space. So there is collectively a sizable group of individuals who have non-canonical combinations of gonadal and sex chromosome status. And if we also think about the gonadal component of biological sex, uh, the physiological meaning of this um, varies um, a lot uh, dramatically over fetal childhood and uh, later in adult life. And then finally, it's crucial not to conflate statistical uh, statements about phenotypic differences with evaluative statements about fitness or worth. Okay, so now it's important to study sex differences uh, for many reasons, uh, one of which is the prevalence of these in um, disease. And so this slide is just illustrating um, some, some well-known uh, diseases that have sex biases. So um, over here on the left, you can see uh, a variety of different neurodegenerative and neuropsychiatric uh, disorders. Uh, and these are mainly or more commonly uh, male biased uh, than female biased, just autism um, and um, attention deficit disorder. And this is in contrast to autoimmune disorders. Um, that have a lot of uh, prevalence of being female bias, such as uh, lupus or multiple sclerosis. And so in regard to sex chromosomes, we all know that one of the most fundamental differences between males and females is sex chromosome content. And females have two X chromosomes and males have an X and a Y. And these sex chromosomes arose about 290 to 350 million years ago from a set of uh, proto-sex chromosomes. Uh, and this followed the, uh, the emergence of this male determining factor called SRY, 
on what will become the Y. And so over, over time, there was an accumulation of sex-specific genes on the future Y, which led to the loss of recombination and the accumulation of mutations, uh, which all these were eventually lost. And what you end up is with the shrinking Y chromosome uh, with mostly different gene content uh, compared to its X, uh, X partner. And in fact, the modern X chromosome has about 900 or so genes on it uh, versus the Y, which is only has about 50 genes on it. And so this differential content in the, uh, of sex chromosomes uh, gave rise to the need to balance gene dosage between uh, the sexes, between males and females. Uh, and this is called uh, sex chromosome dosage compensation. And so just as I mentioned, sex chromosome dosage is not equal between males and females. So to correct for this imbalance between the sexes, one X is randomly chosen and, and largely transcriptionally inactivated uh, through the process of X inactivation. This occurs very early in differentiation um, and, and development in females. Um, so this slide is pretty busy, but I just wanted to, to draw attention to um, a few things. Um, so X chromosome activation is initiated by this long non-coding RNA called EXIST, which is shown here in this, as this squiggly red line. Um, this uh, non-coding RNA is upregulated by what will become the inactive X. It, it spreads around the, the X chromosome and coats it. Uh, and this is this kind of initiates this cascade of epigenetic events, uh, which uh, includes the loss of active histone marks, uh, such as H3K27 uh, acetylation, and accumulation of negative marks, such as H3K27 trimethylation and uh, DNA methylation. And you can kind of visualize X inactivation through different different ways. So in the top is um, RNA fish that targets the exist uh, non-coding RNA, and you can see this little uh, spotty. Uh, cloud that suggests or indicates coding of the inactive X. You can also look at it through um, immunofluorescence, uh, look, using uh, antibodies for H3K27 trimethylation, and you can see that um, this little this this little cluster here um, also uh, is indicative of um, increased um, presence of egg, of this modification across the X chromosome. And then finally, you can look at it through uh, regular microscopy, and you can see this dark. Uh, spot here, which is called the bar body. This is the uh, condensed inactive X. And so despite dosage compensation, there are some genes uh, that are uh, remain expressed from, uh, from the inactive X chromosome, and these are called escape genes. Um, they escape silencing. And there are several different types of these. So uh, there are these PAR genes. So PAR stands for pseudo-autosomal region. And this uh, is a region of homology between the X and the Y. Uh, these genes are present on the X and the Y, uh, and they're often male biased in expression because of uh, the spread of X inactivation on the inactive X in females into the PAR, PAR region. Uh, there are non-PAR Y genes that are male specific, and those are obviously um, male biased. Um, and then you have non-PAR X and Y paralogs. Uh, these often escape X inactivation, but can have different functions. And then you have X-specific or X-linked genes that escape X inactivation, and these are oftentimes female biased in their expression. And in the mouse, there are about three to 6% of X-linked genes escape X inactivation and remain expressed from the second X chromosome or the other X chromosome. Um, and then in the human, that number jumps up to about 15 to 25%. And so here's just sort of an illustration of the, the expression differences. So through a meta-analysis of thousands of RNA-seq experiments, you can appreciate that the escape genes on the top here show female biased expression in brain, uh, non-brain, immune system, uh, tissues, and sex organs. While the PAR genes are down here show male biased expression, um, also like, like I mentioned, due to spread of X inactivation into this PAR region. And I should mention that each point on this graph is a tissue type. Um, and, this, and the dots consist of uh, expression from about, from 89 different escape genes. Uh, this analysis was done by D. Nguyen in our lab. And so why is euploid sex chromosome number important? So individuals that don't have uh, euploid number or they have sex chromosome aneuploidy um, have, have things like uh, Kleinfelter syndrome. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, individuals with uh, an extra X or a 47 XXY. Um, this occurs in about one to a thousand males. Um, and among other phenotypes, they have learning disabilities, um, heart abnormalities are and are infertile. Um, in the middle, you have triple X syndrome. So these are females with three X chromosome, um, 47 XXX. This has similar occurrence as Kleinfelter syndrome, one in a thousand females. Um, they, the, this is generally more tolerated, but um, 
they also have cognitive deficiencies and uh, learning, learning disabilities as well. And then on the other end of the spectrum is Turner syndrome. So Turner syndrome individuals are 45X. Uh, most of these individuals die during embryogenesis, but the ones that do survive um, have a lot of um, deficiencies such as congenital heart defects and immune system defects um, and visuospatial abnormalities. Um, and also it's cognitive uh, deficiencies. And so I just want to show this slide to illustrate a couple of things. The first thing is, the, is that in, in cases of extra X chromosomes, so for example, in uh, Klinefelter syndrome, you have an extra X in a male, and in triple X, you have an extra X in a female, um, each extra X chromosome is inactivated. Um, but what you'll notice here, the second thing I wanted to illustrate is that the escape genes are not, they still, es they still escape from the extra X chromosomes. So you have, uh, so that there's a greater dosage of these escape genes um, in Klinefelter individuals and triple X individuals when you compare them to uh, normal males and females and especially uh, Turner syndrome. And so it's thought that dosage of these escape genes, um, at least in part, drives sex differences we see between males and females and probably contributes to phenotypes that we see in cases of sex chromosome aneuploidy. So there's strong evidence that suggests that this is the case, um, especially when looking at um, cognitive phenotypes. So for example, Klinefelter's individual and um, triple X individuals often have lower IQs than their uh, controls. And um, Klinefelter individuals that have, uh, they have two copies of the escape genes and three copies of the XY paralogs. These individuals sometimes aren't even diagnosed until um, puberty or until they try to have children uh, because they're infertile, they, they get a diagnosis after that. And that's in contrast to people that have severe Klinefelter syndrome where uh, they have uh, four X's and a Y. Or, um, and that leads to uh, five copies of these paralogs and four copies of these escape genes. And that's in comparison to the normal female, and normal male, which have two and, and one. And so this is further highlighted by a study from Armin Rasnahan's lab that looked at brain structure changes in these sex chromosome aneuploidy individuals. And he showed the general trend of um, more severe um, contraction and expansion in these regions that he measured um, with the addition of extra um, sex chromosomes. But despite all this, there are study, uh, in general studies, including sex chromosomes and sex differences are lacking. So for example, preclinical research studies often use only males um, or simply omit reporting. They just don't tell you what sex of the mice or the subjects that they're using or the cells they're using. Um, many, many studies, including GWAS studies, often include these sex exclude the sex chromosomes as confounding factors uh, due to X inactivation and the repetitive nature of the Y. And this is just a, G a GWAS example of a study on autism, which is a highly male biased disease. Uh, and they don't include the sex chromosomes here. Um, and then recently, uh, the NIH has mandated that um, if you want to write a grant, uh, using looking at looking at anything, you need to include both sexes when possible. And so all this illustrates the need for more studies that include both sexes, as well as analysis of sex chromosomes, because they are important biological factors. Okay, so for the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about the effects of sex chromosome dosage on genome-wide gene expression um, in cell types that are relevant to um, human disease models. So one challenge in studying the role of sex chromosomes in disease is being able to distinguish between the effects of sex chromosome content and hormones. And in mice, there are ways to do this. So for example, this four core genotype mouse model um, involves breeding a male with the male determining SRY factor on an autosome and not on, a, not on the Y chromosome. And you can breed that with a, with a wild type female and you end up getting these four core genotypes. Uh, you can have XX females with ovaries, um, XY females with ovaries, XM, XX males with testes and XY males with testes. And depending on the way you compare them, you can compare them this way to see the effect of the sex chromosomes, um, or you can uh, look at this way and see the effects of um, biological sex. And one example of a study, a recent study using these is from uh, Dina Dubal's lab that used a, a mouse model of AD or Alzheimer's disease. And she bred those to these four core genotypes. Um, and she brief, and just sort of briefly, she showed that um, the AD mice that have two X chromosomes, um, regardless of their, bio of their biological sex, um, if they had two X chromosomes, they had longer lifespan um, in this AD model, uh, and they always performed better at um, cognitive tests um, in the AD model as well.
Okay, so in humans, though, it's difficult to do this. So it's difficult to investigate the role of sex chromosomes independent of hormones. Um, so there are need, there is a need for models. So in our lab, we used patient-derived induced pluripotent stem cells from people with different numbers of sex chromosomes. Um, and this will help us to address the contribution of sex chromosomes to things like uh, X-linked disorders, uh, sex X chromosome aneuploidies, and then sex bias diseases, like I mentioned before, uh, neurocognitive disorders, immune, system def defects, and then um, heart abnormalities as well. And so Gala Filipova in our lab generated um, isogenic iPSCs from individuals with different numbers of sex chromosomes using two different methods. So the method on the left, my mouse, um, is, uh, is, is uh, derived from uh, David Russell's lab. And this is where we inserted a uh, TK Neo cassette an X specific or exist specific TK Neo cassette. We selected four, the integration of this, and then that was followed by um, selection against. So um, those cells that survived this negative selection have lost this X chromosome. And so you see um, when you clone these, you end up getting cells that are XXY and XY, and they all came from the same individual, hence the isogenic nature um, of this. The second method was simply cloning um, cells with different genotypes from patients that were naturally mosaic. So for example, here, this, this individual had cells that were both XXY, or had a population of cells that were XXY and a population that were XY, and you can clone them out and you can get um, individual cell lines with different genotypes from the same individual, again, making isogenic cells. Um, and then we also had individuals that had triple X and um, XO. Um, we cloned them out as well and made um, lines with different sex chromosomes. And so in addition to uh, separating hormonal effects versus sex chromosome effects, there are other challenges. Um, so there's a natural genetic variability between individuals. Uh, this may contribute to noise in molecular studies. And then we, we hope that these isogenic uh, cells may help mitigate that noise. There's also a problem with access to relevant human tissue types. So I mentioned before that individuals with sex chromosome aneuploidies like Kleinfelter and Turner syndrome, they often have um, uh, congenital heart defects uh, and um, uh, neurocognitive issues. So uh, it's obviously hard to get samples of, of those from people. Um, so this model helps with that since we differentiated them into those, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then simply comparing XX and XY cells uh, cannot help us distinguish uh, the roles of the X from those of the Y. And so, like I mentioned, we differentiated these cells with different numbers of sex chromosomes into, um, into tissues that are relevant for study. So we used, we did neuro precursors. It's kind of hard to see, but there's these little rosette formations. They sort of orient themselves in a little flower looking thing. Um, and that's sort of what we're looking for. And then for, um, we did cardiomyocytes. And so during differentiation, they kind of start to beat in the dish. So um, they just spontaneously start to act like heart cells. And that's sort of a good indication that we have the right cell type there. And here I'm just showing you all the different um, cell lines that we were able to, um, to derive and isolate. Um, here is in the yellow is an isogenic pair from the um, selection method that I met, mentioned. Uh, we have two isogenic pairs here um, that are from mosaic individuals, like I mentioned. We also have independent um, individuals. So these are cell lines from Turner syndrome um, patients. Um, different each, each line, X4, X6, is a different person. Uh, we have control females uh, and our control males. And then again, I mentioned this isogenic pair from triple X and XO, um, also from uh, also isogenic uh, pairs. And so since we are focusing on um, sex chromosome aneuploidy, we started by looking at expression from the X and the Y chromosomes. Uh, so we focused on genes that escape X inactivation. Um, and you can see when you look at the comparison on top, we compared XX cells to XY cells. And for most of these cells, um, all the escape genes that we looked at were all biased towards two X chromosomes. Um, the purple dots are NPCs or neural precursors, and the cardiomyocytes are in green. Um, and then I mentioned that the PAR genes, which are shown on this side, are often male biased due to the spread of X inactivation. And here we see that most of them are, in fact, um, male biased. I want to bring your attention to this one gene here, this ANOS1 gene at the very far left. So this gene in, is heavily male biased compared to the other escape genes, only in NPCs. And so this gene, this ANOS1 gene, is involved in the migration of nerve cells and axon outgrowth uh, during development differentiation. 
um, it is a it is causative in something called Kalman syndrome, uh, which is a male bias disease that affects um, the sense of smell um, and uh, production of hormones. And that prevalence, and it's about four to five times more prevalent in males uh, than females. In the next comparison, we compared our Klinefelter cells to our male cells. Uh, you can still see that where you have more X chromosomes, the escape genes are generally more highly expressed uh, compared to when you have less. Um, and the PAR genes um, here are not, do not X dosage dependent, but they're sex chromosome dosage dependent. So where you have three, three sex chromosomes versus two, they're more biased that way because they are present on the Y um, and the X chromosome. And what's interesting to me is that when you when you add a Y chromosome here, right? So you do XXY versus XY, that, that sex bias in ANOS ANOS one is is gone, disappears. So which which to me suggests um, that the this X-linked escape gene expression is being driven by uh, the presence of a Y. Now most of these escape genes are consistent between the two tissue types, um, so 48 being in common. Uh, but there are some instances of tissue-specific expression or cell type-specific expression. So, for example, in NPCs, you have this PCD, PCDH11X, and this is involved in neuroplasticity. Uh, you also have in the cardiomyocytes, you have KLHL4 and CLTRN, uh, and these are specifically expressed or escaping in cardiomyocytes. And so I mentioned how... how uh, these escape genes often scale with copy numbers. So here we group them a little bit differently than, than on the previous slide. Uh, these are just schematics of how we have how we did it. So the top one is based on X copy number. So one, so cells with one X compared to two compared to three. And then on the bottom is a, is the sex chromosome uh, copy number series. Again, one, two, and three, um, but they're different lines based on their um, sex chromosome content. And the genes that are are well-known escape genes like KDM6A and KDM5C, they all seem to generally track well with the um, with X, X chromosome dosage, um, just further highlighting the fact that they escape. Uh, and this is in contrast to this ID, IDS gene, which is a um, inactivated gene. And you can see that sort of flat across, so it doesn't really track with dosage um, with X chromosome copy or X chromosome dosage, and that's pretty much what we should, we should see because it is inactivated. And then for the PAR gene example here, the CD99 gene, uh, we looked at it um, using the sex chromosome uh, dosage copy number series. And you can see generally in NPCs um, and in cardiomyocytes, it sort of tracks well with the uh, sex chromosome dosage. Okay, so sex chromosome effects um, or dosage effects, uh, it's not limited to the aneuploid chromosome. It's not limited to the sex chromosomes. Uh, there's been, uh, it's been shown that changes in autosomal genes um, or changes in sex chromosome dosage can drastically alter autosomal gene expression too. And here, another study from Armin Rastahan's lab used blood cells from individuals with sex chromosome aneuploidy. Uh, and you can see up to 2,200 different genes can be uh, changed, uh, you know, based on the uh, stringency. Um, can be affected uh, based on sex chromosome dosage. And then not only that, it looks like that um, uh, co-expression networks can be affected. So this is um, weighted correlation analysis. And you can see that this, this genes expressed in this um, network uh, are, are uh, decreased in XO, uh, XO individuals or XO cells compared to um, increased expression in XXY individuals. And this is compared to um, the XX and XY or the diploid or euploid individuals. And so we also see an effect um, of X chromosome dosage on autosomal gene expression. So when we looked at differentially expressed genes between XY and XX cells, we also looked at um, independently uh, derived, independent uh, XXY versus XY cells, as well as our isogenically derived XXY, XY pairs. And so the least number of differences that we saw occurred in the isogenic comparisons with as little as seven genes being uh, differentially expressed between XXY and XY isogenic lines, um, and then and, uh, 61 in the cardiomyocytes. Um, and we saw this, we, like, we saw this at different stringencies, both the 0.5a log change and the one. And so uh, this does, in fact, suggest that um, use of isogenic pairs for analysis can help uh, mitigate that uh, genomic genetic variation that we see when we compare um, independent individuals. Okay, so because we're interested in how sex chromosome dosage may affect 
sex differences, we looked at how sex chromosome aneuploidy affects expression of a subset of autosomal genes that have sex biased expression. And so first we established a list of genes that have sex biased expression in our lines, looking, uh, comparing XX and XY cells. Um, it's important to note that the numbers on this slide are a bit different from the previous slide because in this analysis, we've used only genes that have a gene name and um, that are um, a minimum of 1.5 fold different between males and females. And so we saw 405 uh, sex biased genes in MPCs and 143 in cardiomyocytes. Um, and we noticed that these, that these uh, sex bias genes are highly tissue specific with only 11 uh, in common between the two uh, cell types. And um, what we noticed when we looked at the gene ontology, we noticed that these terms uh, associated with sex bias genes um, are, are consistent with functions um, in cell types we analyzed. So for example, in the NPCs, um, we saw a lot of processes that are uh, involved in uh, synaptic signaling and regulation of ion transport and nervous system processes. Um, while in the cardiomyocytes, we saw a lot that are involved in calcium, uh, calcium transport. And so uh, next, I wanted to see if this particular subset of autosomal uh, genes was affected by uh, differential sex chromosome content. And so here, these are the same, on the left-hand side, uh, these are the same uh, scatter plots. Um, uh, that I just showed you, but in the middle uh, here and on the left, we changed the comparison um, for, to 46XY, uh, 47XXY, so males to Kleinfelter. And uh, these black dots are the same genes, are the same orange and blue dots, but just using this comparison instead of uh, the normal euploid comparison. And you can see that when you change this comparison, uh, the sex differences in these genes sort of come, come together, so it lessens, it lessens the difference between the two. Um, between the male and female biased genes. And you can see that in um, NPCs and cardiomyocytes. Um, and as well, when you change the comparison from Kleinfelter to female, you can see this, but to a lesser effect. So it's still kind of um, spread out in these two tissue types uh, compared to um, the middle, middle comparison, which is uh, Kleinfelter versus male. And this is sort of consistent with the fact that here you're adding an X chromosome that has 900 genes that so probably have a bigger effect on autosomes uh, versus adding a Y, which only has about 50 genes. And so this also shows that um, while the sex bias genes we identified are highly tissue specific and vary between cell types, the effects of sex chromosome dosage are consistent. And so here I'm just showing the difference between uh, the difference in expression between genotypes for these genes. So for example, on the left-hand side, you have um, male or female bias genes. So it's, it's the expression level of the male, the male value minus the female value. And each dot represents a, a gene. And this, these are the same sex bias genes we just looked at. So these on the bottom are uh, female biased and these on top are male biased. And when you, similar to what I just showed, when you add, add sex chromosomes, you get sort of a tightening of this sex bias, um, almost, almost kind of disappears. Um, but in this slide, I added two more comparisons. I added cases where you, you lose sex chromosomes. So XY versus XO and XX minus XO, you can see that sex biases are kind of um, enhanced. So it sort of spreads out across the whole, um, the whole, the, the whole uh, scale. And so to me, this sort of suggests that these sex biased autosomal genes are highly sex chromosome dosage sensitive. And again, even though these sex biases, uh, these sex biased genes are different, um, the, the processes or the effect of sex chromosomes um, is same between NPCs and uh, cardiomyocytes. Okay, so for this part of the talk, um, I talked about how changes in X chromosome number contributes to congenital disease, for example, Kleinfelter syndrome. Uh, there are others that we, we are studying, like Triple X and Turner, um, but I did not have really, I didn't really have time to talk about those in detail today. Um, I've also shown that using um, pluripotent stem cells is a powerful way to uh, study the effects of sex chromosome content in hard to obtain relevant tissue types. Uh, free of hormonal effects and environmental factors. And using these isogenic cells can minimize genetic variability. And then finally, we see that sex differences um, in autosomal gene expression, uh, again, prior to hormonal influence, uh, these seem to be driven by sex chromosome dosage, maybe through these escape genes um, or Y-link genes. 
And these are uh, cell type specific. Um, and this stresses the importance of studying relevant cell types because you might have different genes in different uh, tissues. Okay, so for the next part of the talk, I'm gonna focus on one of these escape genes that I've been uh, interested in for some time and how I've been trying to uncover its roles in uh, female specific functions. Um, okay, so this escape gene is KDM6A. So KDM6A is a histone demethylase. It shows consistently higher expression in females compared to males. This on the right-hand side is just an array of different tissue types from the GTEx database, um, where you can see in each different tissue type, uh, pink being female uh, and blue being male, um, you can see that in each tissue type, it's more highly expressed in females compared to males. And you can take just about any tissue you want from the GTEx database, and you'll see the same the same pattern wherever this gene is expressed. And then I also want to mention that it has a Y-linked copy or a Y-linked paralog uh, called UTY, and they share about 83% um, homology between the two. And so what does this do? Well, I mentioned it's a demethylase. So it has this domain, this JMJC or Jamunji domain that catalyzes the removal of this repressive mark K27 trimethylation, uh, particularly at uh, bi bivalent domains. Um, to facilitate or turn on genes. So K27 is repressive. So if you remove it, you can turn on genes. Um, bivalent domains, so these are considered to be uh, poised for either activation or repression. And these domains oftentimes have both repressive and activating marks at the same time. And they rely on things like KDM6A to come in and resolve these domains either to be expressed or silenced. And this is very critical um, during development. Um, I do want to mention that its Y-linked copy or Y-linked paralog does not have demethylase activity, so it solely functions through a demethylation independent uh, mechanism. Um, and so does KDM6A. So it also has this other region, this TPR repeat, that facilitates protein-protein uh, interactions. It's been shown to be involved in this MLL4 complex where it can recruit this um, um, acetyltransferase P300 to uh, regulate enhancers. And it, it works this way through demethylase independent activity. So KDM6A has both um, demethylase dependent and independent, whereas UTY is widely copy only as independent mechanism. Um, it plays a role in differentiation. So in mouse, um, it's important or critical for mesoderm and ectoderm lineage development. Uh, it's widely expressed in the embryos um, and it is female homozygous lethal. So uh, but not in males, where UTY seems to some, somewhat, uh, somehow compensate, probably through demethylase-independent activity. And, the, and here I'm just showing that um, on the left-hand side, this is a heterozygous knockout embryo um, at E10.5. This, uh, compared to the homozygous knockouts that die at this time point um, through neural tube closure defects and heart, or heart malformations. And then on the right-hand side is a hemizygous male knockout uh, looks pretty similar to the heterozygous female knockout. But I should, I should mention that these males that do survive, uh, they survive at a much less, uh, much less rate or lower rate than you expected. So about 25% um, versus uh, wild type. And, they're, and the ones that do survive are runted or much smaller than their litter mates uh, through, throughout life. So UTY provides partial compensation, uh, not complete. It's also Im involved in uh, many human diseases. So um, it's causative in, this, uh, in something called Kabuki syndrome. So these individuals have characteristic facial features. They have cognitive um, deficiencies, learning de learn, uh, developmental de delay. Sometimes they have cleft lips or cleft palates. It also serves sort of a protective effect in mouse models of AD, so overexpression of KDM6A. Um, to in males to restore it to a female or an XX level uh, provides um, attenuates male vulnerability in AD. Um, it's also uh, been shown to be critical as a, a tumor suppressor in male biased cancers. So here I'm just showing um, several male biased cancers and the incidence of um, some sort of defect. So for example, bladder cancer, 24% of bladder cancers have some kind of somatic defect in KDM6A. And these are highly male biased um, cancers, about three, uh, three to one. And the same information is shown here for um, other male biased cancers. 
Okay, so not only does KDM6A consistently escape between individuals and tissues, its escape status is remarkably conserved between species. So here you can see this is just a simple little figure that shows all, this, all the um, species that this has been studied in and it escapes in every single one. And um, so this together suggests a conserved need for a higher dosage of KDM6A in females compared to males, which led us to ask the question, so did this evolve, did escape uh, of KDM6A evolve as a mechanism to regulate female biased expression and or uh, female specific processes? And so we've been studying this for some time. Um, uh, a little while ago, we were able to show that KDM6A regulates these um, homeobox genes on the X chromosome. Um, in a female specific manner. Uh, these genes are maternally expressed in printed genes. So that sort of opened us up, opened the door for us to look more broadly at allelic regulation. And so the next project looked at that um, and we were able to show that KDM6A preferentially regulates um, maternal alleles um, as well as some other maternally expressed in printed genes. Um, and it does so through demethylation and demethylation independent mechanisms here. And then more recently, um, we are starting to investigate the role of KDM6A in X inactivation itself. So both processes escape and um, uh, X inactivation are female specific. And we're trying to look at how these two things sort of interact. Okay, so now remember that X inactivation uh, is random in humans and in mouse and that either X chromosome has uh, approximately an equal chance to be um, inactivated. And so this poses a challenge when studying X-linked gene expression uh, because we can't distinguish expression between the active and the inactive X, um, even with polymorphisms. And so to get around this, we used uh, this T6 stop model. So this is a model with um, where these ESLs were derived from a cross between 129 species and a cast, castaneous mouse. Um, these cells have a mutation in a gene called T6. And so T6 just exi exists spelled backwards. Um, is a repressor of exist, and these cells, this and this mutation renders T6 unable to be transcribed. So after differentiation, you don't have random X inactivation; you have completely skewed X inactivation, so that all cells in the population have the 129X inactivated. And because they're hybrid, you can look at uh, polymorphisms. And so this model allows us to um, distinguish between alleles via the polymorphisms I mentioned, and to analyze. Uh, expression specifically from either the XI or the XA, and XI being inactive X, XA being active X. The other model we used um, was another hybrid model. Um, this one is derived from a cross between black six mice and castaneous, um, does not have a mutation in T6. So after differentiation, you have the typical uh, random X inactivation. And this model doesn't allow us to look specifically at XI or XA expression, but it does allow us to look at allelic changes um, elsewhere via the polymorphisms. And so we took these ESLs and we used CRISPR to delete two different locations of the KDM6A gene. Uh, here's just a map of where, this, uh, where these deletions fall. The delta P deletion is uh, for promoter. So this is a 5 KB deletion that covers the, that covers the promoter and into exon one. Um, the exonic deletion here or delta E is a 45 KB deletion uh, deletes um, uh, exon two, three, and part of four. Um, and um, for the promoter deletion, we did that in this E8 model. And for the exonic deletion, we did that in the T6 model. Um, the gels below are just to confirm the deletion status in our wild type cells, in our CRISPR controls, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and our homozygous deleted clones. And on the right-hand side are chromatograms illustrating the, the uh, non-homologous end joining after CRISPR. So the sequences on the left-hand side of the arrow here are on the left-hand side of, the, of this cut site, and the right-hand sequence is on the right-hand side. And so the arrow, black arrow, is where it sort of comes together and joins, and you can get a sequence. You can, just, you can tell that that big piece is just gone. And we generated, um, to, we, we used, for the T6 stop model, we used uh, two wild type uh, clones. We used two homozygous knockout clones, and we looked at two CRISPR control clones. The CRISPR control clones are the cells that 
were subject to CRISPR but did not get a deletion. So these are supposed to control for the CRISPR process itself because you have a lot of things like cloning and selection, stuff like that. So that might impact things. Um, and I'll remind you that the 129 X chromosome in this model is uh, always inactivated. For the E8 cells or the promoter deletion, uh, we used um, we used two wild types uh, and compared to two uh, independent um, CRISPR knockout lines. Um, and then again, these cells have random X inactivation. And then we took these cells through differentiation. Uh, we looked at our, we used uh, RNA-seq with allelic analysis to look at transcription, uh, transcription changes or gene, cha gene expression changes uh, before and after differentiation. And then we looked at chromatin modifications um, with uh, allelic analysis. And we also did some um, in situ hybridization studies. So first we looked at um, differentially expressed genes uh, between wild type and knockout. And so we saw um, more genes at differentiated cells or day 15 compared to day zero. And this is what we expected because of uh, the role of KDM6A has in, in uh, regulating processes of differentiation. So we would expect more genes to be changed after differentiation uh, than before. And interestingly, in this population of down-regulated down genes, we saw exist. And I remember the exist gene is the one that's upregulated during differentiation to initiate X inactivation. And so when we looked at um, expression profiles of, of uh, exist, we saw that in our ES cells, or the cells that weren't, um, that are not differentiated, wild type and knockout clones both had no exist expression, which is, which is what we should see, because it doesn't get turned on until you start differentiating. Um, in differentiated cells, uh, we see this marked increase of, of um, exist expression, uh, just like we should. And then in the knockout clones, uh, we see it fails to upregulate. And so this sort of culminates in uh, our wild type cells having a around a seven and a half fold increase of exist expression versus our knockouts, which is about three or two and a half or three. Um, and so if you remember, X inactivation, like I said, is initiated by upregulation of exist. So we hypothesized that KDM6A may play a role in, in, active, in X inactivation through exist. So what we did was we looked at um, earlier time points. So the previous slide had day zero and day 15. Uh, this one is a differentiation time course um, using qPCR. And we saw that for the wild type cells, which are here in gray and black, we saw the characteristic upregulation during the early stages of X inactivation of exist. Um, and that's in contrast to the uh, knockout lines, which are here in red and yellow. And we see it again fails to upregulate even during the earliest stages of X inactivation, with the biggest difference being around day seven. And then I mentioned we had CRISPR controls, so we looked at how, how those change. And so when we compare our CRISPR controls in wild types um, at day four versus ES cells, you can see similar to wild types, a robust upregulation of exist um, in the controls. Now these, again, were taken through the CRISPR process, but does not, they do not have a deletion in KDM6A. Um, so this suggests that changes in exist are due to uh, the knockout and not the CRISPR process itself. So one other thing that we were concerned with is that is the loss of the inactive X chromosome during culture. So this is a frequent occurrence in uh, female ES cells. And so we used X chromosome specific DNA fish to confirm that these cells do retain two X chromosomes after differentiation. And in each case, uh, T6 stop, uh, our wild types, our controls and our knockouts. And then even in the E8s, E8 lines, the wild types and knockouts both uh, largely maintain uh, two signals, which suggests that they don't they don't lose their X chromosome and that um, loss of exist expression is not due to loss of the inactive X. And so does this failure of exist to upregulate uh, manifest in uh, a reduced efficacy of X inactivation? And so one thing people do, and I mentioned this before, is to use RNA fish to look at exist clouds. And so each cell should have one cloud signal um, indicating coding of exist um, across or coding of the X chromosome with exist. I mean, you see in the wild type cells, uh, the majority of them do in fact have two uh, or have one signal after differentiation. And that's uh, in contrast to the knockouts that um, lost a signal. So a lot of them lose a signal or have these little pinpoints, um, which is consistent with not a total shutdown of exist, but a uh, reduced expression of exist following uh, KDM6A knockout. And then we took this a little bit further to look at expression. Um, so we did X to A ratios. Um, we did 
all, we looked at X expression versus all autosomes. And then we also looked at X expression versus three, of, three other chromosomes that have similar gene content. And in each case, you can see the higher X to A ratio um, in knockouts, which suggests increased, exist, increased X gene expression after knockout. And then we took advantage of our skewed system and our SNPs or our polymorphisms. And we looked at specifically genes that are expressed from the inactive X um, or genes that are expressed from the active X. Uh, we see that there's a trend of increased expression specifically from the inactive X on this side, uh, but not on the active X. And so this suggests that the increased expression that you see in the XTA ratios is coming from the inactive X um, and not the active X. Um, and so together with the previous results, this sort of uh, suggests to me that increased X-linked dosage uh, following KDM6A is due to impaired uh, X inactivation. And so if you remember, um, KDM6A uh, knockout results in a failure of exist to upregulate, and that's one of the earliest events uh, in X inactivation. And so this suggests that the increased expression of X-linked genes from the inactive X may occur early. So we wanted to look at this. Uh, we wanted to look at when the effects on X-linked gene expression happen in our knockout cells. And so previously, there were papers by uh, Marx et al. and Bordenstein et al. that um, investigated the dynamics of X-chromosome gene silence or X-linked gene silencing uh, by uh, separating X-linked genes into these temporal categories. So you have early, early silence genes, intermediate silence genes, late, and then not silence or escape. And in each instance, you can see that from the inactive X, um, each time point has increased expression in um, knockout cells compared to wild type, which suggests that the effects of um, exist uh, failing to upregulate because of knockout of KDM6A occurs at the very early time points or the genes that are traditionally silenced during the early stages of X inactivation. And for escape genes, you can see there are only two that are downregulated. Um, one is exist, like I've shown you, and the other one is KDM6A, our CRISPR target. Uh, okay. okay, so altogether, I think this suggests that the effects of KDM6A knockout on expression uh, from the inactive X begin at the early stages um, which further supports a role for KDM6A in the initiation stage of X inactivation. And so because the effects of KDM6A on exist expression could be indirect or direct, uh, we investigated changes in KDM6A occupancy using cut and run. And so the top, the top profiles here are just um, wild type at day two of differentiation and wild type cells at day seven of differentiation. And we're looking at the five prime end or the promoterish region. You can see this increase in binding or, or occupancy um, at day seven. And the bottom track is just the difference between the two. So this one is just day seven levels minus day two. Uh, we can sort of highlight this increase uh, at the five prime end. And this is consistent with an increase in exist expression uh, in wild type cells from day two to day seven. So you see this jump from uh, six-fold to 14-fold, and then you can see that sort of correlates with an increase in this um, KDM6A uh, binding or occupancy. So what about, K what about H3K27 trimethylation? So that is the target for KDM6A, uh, removes the repressive mark turn on genes. And so we took advantage of our um, skewed system again and the polymorphisms between the two, and we looked at K27 trimethylation enrichment um, via cut and run again. Um, the top is the top in pink is um, wild type, so no deletion or minus deletion, and the purple is um, with deletion or plus. And again, I'll remind you that the inactive X over here is the 129, and the active X is the cast allele. And you can see that there are three different spots with sort of obvious increases in, K, in H3K27 after knockout. One is the CDX4 gene, it's right here. Um, it shows increases on the, on the inactive X and the active X. This gene is not expressed in our system, so we didn't really fo fo uh, follow that further. Um, FTX, again, you can see a biallelic or an increase, so there's an increase here and increase here on both X chromosomes. But again, this gene is also not expressed in our system, so we kind of um, just focused on exist. And when you blow up the view to, to just look at T6 and exist, you can see this allele-specific increase um, on the inactive X. Um, and you don't see any increases on the active X um, following knockout. And this correlates with allelic expression changes. So for example, here, 
uh, you have no knockout with exist being upregulated um, from the inactive X. Um, and then here in knockout, it's not quite upregulated like um, the, like the uh, wild type. And so we think that this is good evidence uh, showing that KDM6A helps to facilitate exist upregulation on the future inactive X chromosome um, by removing K27 um, in wild type where exist will be upregulated. And so this is sort of just a simplified model of what I think is going on in mouse cells. You have two active X chromosomes um, in ES cells. Uh, once you start differentiation, among uh, many other things, KDM6A comes in, kicks off the repressive mark, exist is turned up, expressed, uh, and it coats, and, be, and you get this little negative, this uh, sunken or shrunken chromosome with H3K27 all over it. Um, and then the bottom two just illustrate the fact that this can occur on either, either allele either maternal or paternal or uh, allele. And so today, overall, I think I've showed that uh, sex-biased expression of escape genes can drive uh, sex differences in autosomal gene expression, and that this is largely tissue-specific. And I've also shown that female-specific uh, functions of escape genes may have evolved uh, as mechanisms to regulate uh, female-biased expression and female-specific processes, uh, such as X chromosome inactivation uh, itself. And so with that, I uh, just want to highlight our collaborators. Um, we have um, Klaus and Anne from Denmark that gave us all these, um, that helped, and Daniel Van Dyke, all these people contributed these um, uh, aneuploidy cells. We have our bioinformatics team, uh, and then uh, Distesh Lab, and all of our funding at the bottom. And that's it. Thank you. So, uh, what? Yeah. What happens if you overexpress KDMs? Uh, like, does it go on a silencing bonanza? Or... An activating bonanza? Oh, activating bonanza, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. There aren't very many studies involved in, with overexpression. Um, the one that I showed that was um, in Dina Duval's lab where she overexpressed it in the uh, AD model seemed to fix things. Um, I mean, you have Kleinfelter individuals with overexpression, and that sort of is a problem. Um, it might have to do with when you overexpress it. So if you overexpress it, like Kleinfelter, they're always having overexpression, even in the earliest stages of development, you get all these congenital issues. But in AD models where they artificially overexpress it in differentiated phenotype or cells and tissues, it has a better uh, kind of a beneficial effect. So it might be developmentally important. So if you do it early, it might be bad. If you do it later, it might fix some stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was curious about the temporal expression of inactivation. Um, if you could just comment on sort of what regulates early versus late inactivation. Like um, for the genes, yeah, it, discounting the genes that escape X inactivation. Uh, so there's some, sometimes, I think some people think it has to do with proximity to exist. So because some models say that it spreads like this, that there are genes that are closer I don't know. I think that's a little controversial because some, I mean, there's still genes that are silenced. Um, yeah, that's kind of the best answer I can give you, I think. And are there any examples of genes that are uh, inactivated early in development and then are activated maybe later in life? You know, like thinking about some of these late onset neurodevelopmental phenotypes where females. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's known that at, as you age, um, X inactivation becomes a little bit leaky. Um, so that definitely can happen. So some genes that are previously silenced may not be, or some genes that were um, escape are expressed more. Because escape genes, I didn't say this, but escape genes never really reach 100% es escape. So they, they're never equal to the active X copy. But when you have erosion or something as you age, it might go back that way too. So yeah, it does happen for sure. And in males, you have loss of Y. And that's very common when you get older too, and that's detrimental too. So all balancing these, the dosage of these X and Y genes for sure. Kind of follow up on the, the loss of Y. Is there a, is there a loss of X 
that happens with aging, like you know, like loss of why. Does it happen with aging? Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I know loss of why has a you know a big thing in in uh, uh, is it cancer common? risk in males and stuff like that. So how common is that? X. Yeah. Yeah, but aren't you you know you have one good co- you know expressing copy and then you have one that's been silenced and you randomly lose one. Yeah. It, presumably, if it's silenced, it doesn't matter. But if it's yeah, you lose the inactive. You always lose the inactive one. If you lose the active, it's you... so that would be bad, presumably for the cell, but somatically, right? I mean, uh... but then, but you lose the escape genes, so that that dosage goes down, and so that's probably you know partially why you get phenotypes and stuff. Well, so I, I only ask because, you know, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, you know, I'm really interested in somatic mutations, somatic variability. Exists. Oh, it just goes completely crazy and silences everything. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so Joel, I was intrigued by these gene pairs like KDM6A and you know uh, UTY that seem to have, they're quite similar, but they have functional divergence. And is that true of many of those pairs or is it kind of unique to this one? Uh, it seems like there's there's another almost qualitative in addition to the quantitative right, level yeah. of regulation on the basis of the presence or absence of a function linked to the the yeah I was, I was looking at this earlier because i thought someone might ask me something about this yeah. uh and i i really only could find that I, this i'm only really familiar with the kdm 6a difference um kdm 5c is another escape gene that's very common um it has a lot to do with neurocognitive issue development but it has a, it's wiling copy, I think, does the same thing. So it's, it also demethylates K4 trimethylation. So in that case, I don't, I'm going to say not much. I don't know about DDX. I don't, I think they, I just listened to a talk from like what's early. <laughs> yeah, they do the same thing. So it might be rare. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I just, Oh, okay. Yeah, I just think, I mean, because I, I, yeah, that's another reason why I like this gene so much, because clearly KDM, the methylation part is highly, it's important in females and not as important in males, because KDM6A only has that, and UTY has only the demethylase independent part, KDM6A has both, so there's some reason why you need more demethylase activity. And it might have to do with, I mean, there's a lot of, there's some studies on X and I mean, again, X activation, there's, you know, it's established in oocytes. There's this huge swath of K27 trimethylation across the exist locus and that's inherited. And so it, it, it's going it's through ESL stage. It has to be removed somehow, but males don't need it because they don't have this X and activation process. I don't know. I'm biased in that. Yes. I had a, a second question about the IPS system, and I guess this is out of ignorance on my part. Um, are are the the system either as IPS cells or differentiated versions of those hormone sex hormone responsive? Can you can you do a, a hormone addition to this system, in addition to the nice dissection that you've done using the genetics, and does that give you any additional insight, or or do you know yet? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't know because you know there I guess. Should get a stage before they are hormonal, they are responsive. I think there was a, a I gave a talk at uh, ISCCR, ISSCR, and there was a there was a lady that was talking to about how she was trying to get rid of hormones, and so she was saying that some of these like B27 additives actually have she had to make her own B27 because it has hormone, it was skewing things in their in her stem cells. So that, that's the answer to that question, and I don't know what you would get. I'm sure you would have some kind of changes, but I don't know what kind of information you could get from that because these are supposed to be before. But, you know, I don't know. They come from people. They were exposed to hormones at some point. So 
don't, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, do I need to read it? So can you comment on the reasons for increased incidence of bladder cancer in men and its relationship to KDM6A? Yes, so KDM6A, they have, it's one copy in, me, in males. And so if it gets mutated, uh, you're gonna have issues. So um, in females, you have random X inactivation. So if you get one copy mutated, you have uh, the other healthy copy that's being expressed that can um, uh, compensate for that. That's a good, why bladder cancer in particular? <laughs> mm -hmm. I was also looking that up today and I, I, I saw a paper that came out this year that was showed that mutations in this, I don't, I don't know why particular bladder cancer. I mean, it's other, other ones as well, but it was very high in bladder cancers. Um, I, I know that it, the paper this year said that these mutations result in a differentiation issue in urogenital development. And so that's what leads to that but I don't know why it's so highly prevalent in, in bladder cancer in particular. Yeah. Questions? Great. Okay, thank you.